Hello friends, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing Man-Made Law is an Opinion Backed by a Gun, from my blog post by the same name. When the concepts of anarchy are explained to a statist, a common argument is, but without rules and a government to enforce them, there would be chaos, mayhem death and destruction. This argument is rooted in two beliefs. First, if government were to vanish tomorrow, we would all be stealing, assaulting, raping and murdering each other. And second, that the fundamental core of human nature is evil and bloodthirsty. The first thing we must keep in mind is that laws do not ever prevent anything. If that were true, then drug prohibition laws would completely eliminate drug use. Drunk driving laws would completely eliminate drunk driving. Rape laws would completely eliminate rape. Infidelity laws would completely eliminate infidelity. Murder laws would completely eliminate murder, etc. Since we know this isn't the case, we must conclude the existence of laws to be wholly useless. In the case of substances, when something is banned, it does not decrease its availability or use whatsoever. In fact, it increases it. This is due to the undeniable fact that when human beings have a desire for something, regardless of what laws are in place, they will obtain that thing by whatever means necessary. As a result, such prohibition laws only bring about the creation of black markets that function to deliver the banned product to an eager clientele. Black markets inevitably bring about a spike in the prices of the banned product. This is due to the many risks, bribes and covert transportation such an enterprising entrepreneur must make to ensure the treacherous delivery of said product to his customers. All this results in higher prices for the consumers who nevertheless are willing to bear the cost, for without them there would be no market. The second thing is that erroneous notion that human nature is fundamentally evil and bloodthirsty. If this were true, how is it that we are able to have peaceful relationships with friends, co-workers, acquaintances, and family? Since laws never prevent any wrongdoing, how is it possible that we maintain these thoroughly anarchic relationships? Government did not approve or authorize them. Therefore, they would theoretically be impossible. Understand that the existence of laws do nothing but harm the truly moral people at the expense of the immoral. Gun laws only disarm the moral people whilst leaving them genuinely defenseless against the immoral thieves and crooks who don't care about murder laws, let alone gun laws. Tyrants who seek to subjugate you with arbitrary laws deserve only your ire and fury. Disobedience to the whimsical dictates of tyrants is obedience to your own moral compass. You own your body. You are your own master. And I finish with two quotes. First with, from Lao Tzu, um, an um, ancient Chinese philosopher, founder of Taoism, and then later traditional Chinese medicine. <clears throat> the more laws and order are made prominent, the more thieves and robbers there will be. And the second is by Plato, ancient Greek philosopher. Good people do not need laws to tell them to act responsibly while bad people will find a way around the laws. All right. So, man-made law is um, something that we've been... Uh, tend, we tend to think that it's a natural state of being, right? There's laws. You know, how would society work without rules, without laws, right? <laughs> but... The first error is in um, assuming that rules 
given by those above us are equivalent to what we would call natural law, right, or common law, which would be, in the natural world, they would include, you know, laws of gravity, laws of thermodynamics, right, laws of mathematics. These are laws that nobody created. Um, they were discovered, right? Um, and so it's not, <laughs> it's not like they're applicable to one specific group of people and not to another, right? There's no giant exception called government where the laws of mathematics or, um, incidentally, the laws of economics don't apply, right? They apply to everyone. So when we begin to um, imagine this giant exception called government, that claims to be exempt from the laws of economics because they can do things such as um, print money, meddle with interest rates, <clears throat> impose oppressive uh, regulations, um, and plunder the citizenry through taxation. Um, when, when this is done, we must realize that there is consequences, all right? Um, it doesn't matter the, the clothes you're wearing, the, the type of badge you have on, um, <clears throat> your background, your heritage, okay? <laughs> there are certain laws, such as laws of economics, which apply to everyone just as much as the uh, laws of gravity and um, thermodynamics and, you know, laws of planetary motion, right? <laughs> these have no exceptions, right? Because we are all men. We are all people, right? So we have to get out of our mind that if something is um, <clears throat> impossible for one person to do, all of a sudden it's possible for, um, you know, a group of people, thousands of people or millions of people. <clears throat> this, um, this we really have to divorce ourselves from because... This primary idea is what <clears throat> gives birth to the ideas that, you know, war produces prosperity, um, printing of money produces wealth, right? Um, <clears throat> or let's say also taxation produces wealth or laws, you know, we can legislate morality through laws um, <clears throat> or we can make a business more productive through regulations. So... We have to really divorce ourselves from this um, erroneous concept because <clears throat> it has no foundation, no basis in logic, okay? If something is impossible or immoral for the individual, it must equally be impossible and immoral for a large group of people or um, a group of people calling themselves government, right? <clears throat> government is essentially a, a man-made construct and um, without the obedience and conformity uh, conferred by the public indoctrination system, also known as public schools, and the media to support all the propaganda, and the politicians to supply the sophomoric rhetoric, um, we would certainly, we can recognize it to be what it truly is which is a murderous and genocidal and enslaving institution and nothing less or nothing more. <clears throat> we have to see things as they are. We must call things by their proper names, as Confucius said. For this is the beginning of wisdom, right? So, <clears throat> laws do not legislate morality, okay? A... Um, a fine example of this is the um, alcohol prohibition in the 1920s, which gave rise immediately to the mafia, Al Capone. <clears throat> and this was no mistake. This was no accident, okay? Um, when the government seeks to ban an item that people um, want to buy, want to purchase, or want to consume, um, there is no law or mandate that can erase 
human desire, right? Or human wants. If a person wants to do something, regardless if it's legal or illegal, they'll do it, right? So if a substance that was previously legal, such as alcohol, all of a sudden becomes illegal, and the desire to purchase that product is still there, you will most certainly see a rise of businesses um, that are willing to deal in this contraband and supply their, um, their demand, right? Supply the, the market with what's wanted and what's needed. <clears throat> now, of course, when it is illegal, this significantly raises the costs, right? For so many reasons, right? You know, you have to worry about transportation. You have to worry about bribing, you know, law enforcement. You have to, um, you have to be stealth about it, right? <clears throat> so, you really have to, uh, you have to realize that the only thing that making something illegal achieves is, first of all, it, it most of the time it increases its consumption in the in the in the cases of alcohol, drugs, you know, cocaine, marijuana, heroin. Um, it increases its use, not decreases, as people want more and more, right? We are, we are irresistibly drawn to that which is illegal. And at the same time, it makes it prohibitively expensive um, for all those reasons of, uh, you know, covert stealth transportation and, uh, you know, the bribing of public officials, right, law enforcement, things like that. So... And then, and of course, you know, just as in any business, you have competition, right? So, <laughs> even in black markets, there's black market competition, right? So, so that in addition would, um, you know, actually that, that should make it cheaper, but <laughs> it actually doesn't, right? But um, that's really the only thing that's achieved. And then, you know, you have uh, laws like, um, let, let's, let's call them nanny state laws, like let's say, um, you know, you can't, buy a uh, it's against the law to buy a 32 ounce soda I think is, is the recent law um, <laughs> something ridiculous like that or even smoking let's say smoking it's against the law to smoke in um, restaurants right or um, in in uh, other I guess public places now one could argue that um, this reduced the amount of smoking in the population. But how would you know that that would not have necessarily have happened through just plain uh, transmission of information and education of the citizenry by themselves, right? Maybe that would have happened of its own accord, right? And, uh, and some people, you know, some people tell me, well, if the government didn't make a law to make smoking illegal in restaurants you know we would still have you know <laughs> we would still have uh, um, smoking uh, sections in restaurants smoking sections in planes right in, uh, in various places so then the question should come up who really who really has control of their own business the entrepreneur or the government right and or who, let's say, who should have control? Because obviously, if the government can make laws and direct business owners to pay their workers a certain wage, to um, you know allow or disallow certain practices such as smoking, right? To impose strict um, so-called uh, health health um, standards, right? Or inspections, right? Things like that for for food businesses, such as restaurants. Um, so if the government can impose those fascistic regulations, then it seems more like the government official is, is in control of the, the businesses rather than the entrepreneur, which is a tragic state of affairs because obviously the, um, the public officials put up no capital, no risk, right? whatsoever in the formation and the the building up of that business right they didn't take any risks whatsoever and who bears all the risk is the entrepreneur right he puts up the capital he 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 comes up with the idea he implements it he um, gets it done gets it built right and um, and then the government 
comes in with its um, meddling, sticky, tentacled fingers and uh, tries to control, control it um, and, of course, uh, siphon away a portion of the profits, right? Um, as if uh, it's their own. <laughs> so, so we really have to think about where, where does wealth, true wealth, actually originate in society? Does it originate from the politicians, from government, or does it originate from the small businesses, from the entrepreneurs, from the people that innovate every day and create the things that we enjoy, the things that we cherish and appreciate, the, uh, you know, the new emergent technologies that we all use, right? Because the more, the more power we give to politicians, to meddle in our affairs, the more they will take, more they will take, right? It's never enough. Power is not self-limiting, right? The only thing that limits power is the degree to which the oppressed allow themselves to be ruled, right? That's the only restriction <clears throat> that power-hungry tyrants have. And that's really, in history, um, all they've ever, all they've ever had. It's, it's the only restrictions they've ever had. So, so we really have to realize that um, <clears throat> laws don't make us feel safer, right? And laws don't. Um, <clears throat> you can't legislate morality. <clears throat> all right. So, why does the government care that we put? certain things in our bodies like drugs like well, what they call drugs I would call them plants and <clears throat> and more off, more accurately call the uh, um, the toxic poison they call pharmaceuticals pharmaceutical medication that should more more accurately be called drugs right because those are far more dangerous to our health than uh, the so-called um, hallucinogenic illegal plants or leaves or flowers <clears throat> I mean certainly the um, cocaine which originated from the coca plant um, perhaps without the war on drugs I would assume I would assert the same thing that happened with alcohol right during prohibition um, alcohol was made more dangerous and concentrated and potent when it was banned because in order to transport it, right, you, you can only transport a small amount. Therefore, it has to be concentrated in order to get the maximum profit, right? So, so in, in, in a similar method, in a similar way, the, perhaps the coca plant, which uh, initially was used by the natives, right, um, when when these um, enterprising entrepreneurs discovered that they can make cocaine, which is a far more powerful um, hallucinogenic substance, um, when they discovered this, right, then, uh, you know, then, then you have an enormous um, possibility for profit under the war on drugs, right? So, so we have to consider that. So the black market... <laughs> You know, we have to we have to realize what what exactly a black market is, right? Um, just like the free market, the black market is people, people willing to trade amongst each other. Okay, um, you have black market, and and actually one uh, interesting anecdote um, for those people that think that we could just legislate certain things out of existence, such as drugs, certain. Um, unapproved activities such as prostitution and gambling um, should realize how how large of an industry in prisons the black market drug trade is and you know if if it was true that the more rules the more laws the more regulations uh, a society has the more um, orderly or you know um, or <laughs> the more they can control their citizenry we must realize that in prison you can't get much more regulated and totalitarian than 
being a prisoner in prison, right? You have no freedom, no freedom of association, no freedom of speech, basically, no um, private property, um, yeah, no possessions. So, um, how is it that such a such a black market in many things can arise in prison? It's it's something worth noting because you know we have to realize that. Um, even in such a constricted, constricted and strangulated uh, environment, people manage to find a way to trade and obtain the things that they want. And um, it always it always happens this way. The more the more laws, the more regulations, the more rules are applied to a citizenry. <clears throat> this does not. This does not achieve the desired effect of decreasing that particular um, action or decreasing the consumption of a particular good. It actually has the opposite effect. It increases it dramatically. All right, um, and so so that that's you know pretty much the reason why uh, you know Lao, Lao Tzu. <clears throat> I quoted that Lao Tzu saying because the more laws, the more rules are in place, the more criminals and the more lawbreakers must be created so we have to realize that that it's not it's not such an easy thing like snuffing out a uh, a flame <laughs> you know human the human condition human nature is supremely adaptable supremely to any situation <clears throat> all right so to a certain point, you know, people will withstand, as in this country, people will withstand laws and regulations <clears throat> and rules to a certain point until they become so, so oppressive and um, burdensome that productivity simply becomes impossible. And, you know, societies where this has occurred, um, which preceded a, a complete collapse, were like you know Soviet uh, Russia, Communist Red China, right? <clears throat> Where the the means of production were so monitored and regulated and controlled and meddled with that entrepreneurs simply could not function anymore. They couldn't produce the things that society needed to sustain itself, right? So in in Soviet Russia, they actually had to receive imports from the United States in the form of food and grains in the form of bread in the form of various uh, <clears throat> various food to feed their population they simply couldn't feed their population with their own farms farmers right and this is the natural this is the natural effect when people who are striving to participate in the marketplace who want to trade, and transact freely amongst each other when they're restricted from doing so it's a logical result <laughs> it's really it's really a logical result so um, one um, one complaint I get from some people uh, they said well some people are evil some people need to be controlled need to be regulated All right? what if what if we were to have a business that polluted the air, right? Polluted the water, polluted whatever. You know, how would we control that without regulations? So that has a few assumptions that we should uh, let's quickly go over. The first assumption is that um, the government is effectively currently regulating those polluting industries, which they're not. <laughs> Um, and and the second is uh, known as um, regulatory capture, which is the the um, method by which enormous mega corporations uh, bribe and pay off the regulators from the government agency that are sent to regulate them. And not only that, but then the the um, the mega corporations send their you know their CEOs, their their top men to to um, inhabit these positions of power in 
in these regulatory agencies so that they can regulate themselves, not only regulate themselves, but write the laws to regulate themselves. <laughs> so to think that uh, such ridiculous re regulations would actually um, prevent corruption in a corporation that is already intimately connected with government, right? Politically intimately connected as a special interest group is quite naive and puerile, okay? We have to realize that, um, you know, when you have a, 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 an institution such as government, where, which concentrates power into a select group of people, you will inevitably, inevitably have um, businesses that are well established to maintain their status of dominance through fawning over the, uh, the gun of the state to protect them. Um, so to protect their status of dominance, to pass favorable legislation in their favor, as well as destroying, um, destroying the ability of small businessmen and entrepreneurs from rising up and competing with them which would naturally drive down their price and increase their quality, their, their product quality, right? Um, so, you know, to those people who say that, that we need government to manage a monopoly, to manage monopolies, to break up monopolies, we have to consider that the government is a monopoly, right? It's a monopoly on initiated aggression, right? Over a given geographical region. The government is a monopoly. There is nothing that can especially the United States government, it's, it cannot be challenged, right? It cannot be resisted with force. Um, so this is why it's so, so important that we realize the sophisms, okay, and the, the smoke and mirrors and illusions that it, um, that it uses to maintain its power and its dominance over us through, through the myth of authority. Very, very important, the myth of authority. The belief that's deeply ingrained in many people that some people have the ability to steal the property of other people. This is something that we have to abandon. Okay, this is very archaic and a very ancient way of living. And it's not the way of men. It's not the way of intelligent people. It's not the mark of a civilization. All right. There are other ways to live without having a parasitical institution at the helm of humanity and expecting that to bring about wealth and prosperity. <laughs> Because history shows, time and time again, that those who do not learn from their mistakes are condemned to repeat them. So I urge all of you to pick up a book and read some economics, read some true history, learn about the past. Because only through learning about the past can we effectively understand what is happening in the present and um, be more likely to predict what will happen in the future. <laughs> and how many people have to die? How many people have to be subjugated? How many people have to be annihilated before we realize that human civilization can be possible without monopolies on violence and aggression? without the initiation of the use of force, without the theft of the property of others, without the tyranny of the majority. So I urge all of you to consider that. I'm going to end right there. Thank you very much. This is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care.